So if you're not saved today, and you happen to have stumbled across this here little podcast with us two stupid British people, pick up your Bible, have a chat with the gods, see what's going on. It's very important and we care about you. Welcome to the Bible in One Year podcast, brought to you by two Brits and a Bible. Today is day 264, covering Joel 1, 2 and 3. Um, so another new book, which means another intro to the new book. That's one of the nice things about the Minor Prophets is you really fly through a lot of books in the Bible. It feels like you're making smashing progress. Uh, um, so book of Joel, likely written in the Ezra, Nehemiah sort of era, but it's actually not certain, um, interestingly enough. It doesn't reference earlier books specifically, in Joel, but he clearly knows a lot about them in just sort of the way it's written, which is quite cool. So uh, kind of written in a date between 500 and 400 BC, uh, a lot of talking about the day of the Lord that came in the past with the plagues and stuff like that, but also about another day of the Lord that's to come. And yeah, there's not a whole lot that's actually known about the book of Joel, which is quite cool. It means you can interpret a lot as you wish. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I do like that. I also think maybe it's partly because it's minor prophets, three books in the Bible. Maybe a little bit less research has gone into this versus some of the bigger, the bigger boys. Don't know, but um, but yeah, it's a good little book. A few good points in there. I I feel like so. Uh, first thing that um I noticed, just an overview of Joel one. It is just this haunting image of a world without God. It's another vision of hell, and so far, you know several of the prophets and several of the books have sort of given this description of of life without god or really existence without god it's not really living you know and joel one is another example of that just this horrible horrible world that without god's love and mercy and grace and gifts in it very true very true um it's from what i gathered from the video about joel from the bible project this first uh chapter is referring to the past day of the lord and then the second chapter because it's about the same thing an invasion of locusts versus an army of locusts it's talking about a future day of the lord so it's yeah. kind of interesting the way it's like looking back and looking forward at the same time yeah it's really cool it's really really cool um and then just a little one uh so joel is not the same as most of the other people of the time so he says this is mentioned in the bible project video as well to you, Lord, I call. So Joel, in just those, you know, five words in English, don't know how many words there's in Hebrew, but still shows great wisdom through all the pain he sees, his in immediate and correct response is simply to cry out to God. Don't try and fix it yourself. Don't try and like do whatever, just cry out to God in those desperate, desperate times. That should be your first response. That's good. Okay. Glad to hear it. Yeah, bro. Uh, um, so into Joel 2, uh, yeah. you've got a first point in there, 2 verse 6, and then I'll crack on with 2 verse 8, I suppose. Yeah, okay. So at the sight of them, nations are in anguish, every face turns pale, so 2 verse 6. So the imagery of this army, which goes against humanity, makes me think about all the demons and things that are described in Revelation and other places in the, those last days before Jesus returns, and smokes them all is what I put. So... You know, um, but I think in the time we're living in, you know, Adam quite wisely, and we've said this a few times on the channel, doesn't live as if it, you know, the world's coming to an end or anything. And I think that's the best attitude. But in this time, whether it's near the end, the end end or not, Jesus second coming or not, I think it is fair to notice that there is a lot of demonic activity happening. There is a clearly a spiritual battle going on. And you know, there are things, unfortunately, that we will see and experience that may well turn us pale in some sense, right? Um, but we can rest assured that Jesus will return and smoke them all. So there you go. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's going to be this sudden, I this has just sort of come to me, like referring to Elisha seeing the army of fire, the chariots of fire surrounding the army. I feel like we feel like we're so big and strong in our little earthly bodies. And then suddenly we're going to have our eyes open to what the spiritual realm actually is. And we are just going to piss ourselves because it's so scary. Like the whole, every knee we wet with urine thing. Yeah. 
it's uh, just like I think there's so much more going on than our little earthly bodies and minds can comprehend. We think we're Billy Big Bollocks, but actually we're just these tiny little things that have no impact on anything, really. Yeah. But we live in our own little beautiful bubble and we're kind of happy being naive in it. So, yeah. It's a really good point, man. Um, it kind of ties in nicely with my next point, actually, which was Joel 2, verse 8, because uh, it's saying they do not jostle each other again, talking about the army of the Lord. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defences without breaking ranks. Then in 11, it says the Lord thunders at the head of his army. Again, I've mentioned a bunch of times about the uh, historical fiction books that I read about a gentleman called Richard Sharp, Richard Sharp. fantastic set of books. Um, but I take so much from out of that and put it in this because it's like it takes such a strong leader who trusts their warriors to actually do this. And it takes strong warriors who trust each other and trust their comrades to know their role. It always reminds me of the phalanx formation in the Roman era, which is where your shield would actually protect the soldier to your left. And then you would be responsible for stabbing with your right and you'd be protected from your right by the. So you're not actually fighting for yourself. You're defending somebody else and fighting, but it forms such a solid unit. But everyone has to know their role and the, whoever's in charge, God in this case, has to trust that his army knows what is going on as well. So I just love the, the visual uh, sort of imagery of that. And I had a note from 2011 saying, be a part of this army. Ah, nice. Well, you know, that's good, man. And I'm going to have to do the, the pointing like normal. That's actually unbelievably good. And it, it works so well for the kind of way that uh, people reading Joel would have um, understood the world. And that's something I really enjoy unpacking with you is like trying to understand like what the people at the time would understand. It's very different to the way we would understand things. But a lot of this imagery is universal to some extent. You've got a couple more good points in two uh, before I need to say anything, honestly. So, cool. uh, so 213, rend your heart and not your garments. Proper kind of old school uh, terminology there. But basically it's saying you need to, instead of, I picture it as like, you know, when they like tear their uh, shoes, whatever, and robes, yeah, all that stuff. But it's like, actually, it's not about that. It's about doing that with your heart. You need to be heartbroken. You need to be torn. It's not about tearing your clothes, making it a big show for other people. You need to be authentic in these sort of crying out to God moments. Um, yeah. And then such an incredible, one of my favorite verses of the Bible, actually, Joel 2.25, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And this has been used so many times for so many people that have come back to God who have had times astray, wandering, living a life they shouldn't have. But actually, the Lord will repay those years to them for the years that they've lost. It just I love that. It is such a redemptive verse and it's so nice. That's so cool. My next verse was 225. I just said in the end, God will make all our injustices right. And that then links to Joel 3 verse 21 where God says, shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. So again, like he, he, he knows he's keeping perfect records of everything. And he's an equivocator and, and, and judge and justice uh, enabler or whatever you want to say. I don't know. It's getting late now. So <laughs> I think that vaguely works what I just said. Um, cheeky Holy Spirit reference to 29 says that he will pour out his spirit in those days. We point out Jesus a lot. It's nice to point out Holy Spirit when he comes up as well. So that's a nice little one. And uh, then the last one I had was just 2.31. Sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The end times, the second coming. And this will be a time of great fear for anyone not saved by Jesus. So if you're not saved today and you happen to have stumbled across this here little podcast with us two stupid British people, Pick up your Bible, have a chat with God, see what's going on. It's very important and we care about you. Yeah, for sure. Um, the last little point I had there was in 3 verse 3 and then later on in verse 7 it says, They cast lots for my people and they traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. Then in 7 it says, See, I'm going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them and return on your own heads what you've done. And basically what they are doing by selling kids and stuff like that for their own good, it will be returned back on them. And I just think that speaks so highly or not so strongly of your sin will find you out and often your sin will be the cause of your own downfall. So, yeah, 
Um, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Thanks very much. Love you all. See you tomorrow.